It's the real news. I'm Aaron Maté. Next month, we'll see the first trial for some of the more than 200 people arrested at an anti-Trump protest on Inauguration Day. At the protest, known as J20, some protesters smashed windows and, according to police, caused about $100,000 in damages. But instead of seeking charges against the actual perpetrators, prosecutors have cast a wide net. Most of these 200 protesters now face eight felony charges, including conspiracy to riot, inciting riot, and rioting just for being present. The defendants face anywhere from 10 to 70 years in prison. My guest argues that the J20 case should frighten anyone concerned about the future of free assembly and dissent in the US. Chip Givens is, is a journalist, as well as the Policy and Legislative Council for Defending Rights and Dissent, has just written a major new piece on the J20 case for the nation. It's called The Prosecution of Inauguration Day Protesters is a Threat to Dissent. Welcome, Chip. So let's talk about the charges that these sure. dozens of people are facing. Just for being at this protest, they're facing felonies carrying up to 70 years in prison. Sure. So the defendants are charged with eight felony counts. They're all uh, related to felony rioting. Initially, they were charged with only one count of felony participating in a riot. And there was a back and forth between prosecutors and defense, which has never been resolved about whether or not participating in a riot can ever be a felony offense. Uh, the statute very clearly states that inciting or urging a riot, if the damage is more than $5,000, is a felony, not a misdemeanor, but it makes no mention of participating in a riot. So instead of responding to the defective uh, indictment that they put out, they brought uh, another seven charges, including conspiracy to riot, four counts of property destruction, 214 people are charged with breaking the same windows. I would love for the prosecutor to demonstrate how you know, 200 people smashed the same window, and a felony conspiracy to riot, felony inciting and urging to riot. And there's still a dispute about the first charge about whether or not it's a felony or a misdemeanor. And the judge thus far has refused to resolve it. At one point, the judge said they would handle that issue at sentencing, which is really mind boggling, because if it's a misdemeanor charge, it carries 180 days in jail. If it's a felony, it carries up to a decade in jail. But how have the prosecutors uh, reconciled that obvious paradox that you mentioned? I mean, if it's not physically possible for 200 people to break the same windows, how are they charging everyone with the same charge uh, for doing that? Well, they're using an unprecedented collective liability theory for the protesters. The argument is that this wasn't a protest march where vandalism just happened to occur. It's a premeditated riot. They had an infiltrator in the organizing meetings. They've indicted one of the organizers. And their argument is that from the very start, the people planned on rioting. Everybody participating in the march was participating in an unlawful assembly just by walking and marching and chanting things like who streets, our streets. They were partaking in, in a riot. And meanwhile, you know, the focus on the defendants has also kind of overshadowed the uh, claims against the police because protesters have uh, accused the police of excessive force in these mass arrests, right? My colleague here at the, my colleague here at the Real News, Baynard Woods, he reported recently that the DC police threw more than 70 stun grenades at the protesters. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I saw that report from your colleague. I mean, they threw what was called stingers, which are some sort of bizarre um, combination of a flash grenade, uh, projectiles, and tear gas. Um, I mean, it's not just critics who are alleging this. The DC Office of Police Complaints released an official report to the mayor on the, on the protest. And they said most likely, or it may be possible, that DC police fired indiscriminately into the crowd, projectile objects, stingers, tear gas, et cetera. They also noted that they don't make a determination about the legality of arrest, but that proximity to the damage seemed to be the deciding factor in who they arrested, and that it was possible that there was not individual probable cause for all people arrested, which would make the arrest unconstitutional and illegal. Huh. So in terms of the quote unquote evidence that uh, authorities are citing against these protesters, you write in your piece about some interesting 
um, facets of that, including that because some were wearing black, that all of a sudden <laughs> makes them suspicious and worthy of being charged. I mean, this is the most remarkable thing. I mean, one of the main things in the indictment is they're wearing black clothing. Wearing black clothing is not a crime. And this comes up particularly in the case of Aaron Cantu, who's a journalist, one of about seven journalists who were arrested during the mass arrest, because when you peddle a group of people in a geographic area, you sweep up everyone indiscriminately. But the other journalists had their charges dropped against him, except for Aaron Cantu and one other and, you know, one of the arguments the prosecutor makes is that this reporter was wearing black and his current employer, the Santa Fe reporter, is standing by him. But they made this really sad comment to the, not sad because they made it, but sad because of the prosecution to the uh, Baltimore City paper. What would you do for next time? Well, next time he'd wear a suit and tie, you know, because that would somehow make him no longer a criminal. But, you know, based on the prosecutor's logic, I mean, that's a totally reasonable thing for the Santa Fe reporter to to say I'm, I'm not I'm not finding fault with them I'm finding fault with the perversity of this prosecution right so these reporters who are still facing charges out of the original group of, of reporters who were initially charged they're with the Santa Fe reporter and the new inquiry which is a, um, a magazine based here in New York um, where I'm speaking to you from um, now, these are smaller outlets, right? Now, compare that to the bigger outlets whose reporters, their charges were dropped against them. And I'm wondering if that's not incidental. You know, I don't really know. I think there were some reporters from smaller outlets who did have their charges dropped against them. I would have to go back and look at all of the outlets. It's really just a very random prosecution. I, I don't know if there is sort of a malicious intent behind it or, or a disregard for smaller outlets. Well, let me just say, let me just say on that front, if you're with a smaller outlet, then by then obviously you're going to have less resources to fight yes. it. And I do, I do that's know that there was some reporters from NBC who had their charges dropped, but uh, yes. that's fair enough. I didn't know that there are other, maybe other smaller uh, reporters from other smaller outlets who also had their charges dropped. So fair enough. But, you know, on this front about the media, um, I want to uh, bring up a point that Adam Johnson made. He's a writer for... Uh, the LA Times and for uh, FAIR, the media watchdog group. And he wrote to some top media reporters at uh, CNN and also at the Washington Post and, uh, and somewhere else too. And he says he only got uh, th three of the people he wrote, uh, two of them didn't write him, uh, write him back. And the one response he got was from the, the media reporter at the Washington Post who says, I cover hundreds of stories. I can't cover everything. So even to these media reporters, charging journalists who were covering a protest, who now face up to 70 years in prison, was not even worth writing about to them, or even worth responding to Adam Johnson about either. Well, I mean, it's really just shocking. And I think part of the problem is that the media plays a tremendous role in demonizing protesters. They're very happy to go along with the government's narrative. And every time we have a big event, whether it's a political convention or inauguration or a media of the World Bank, I mean, the police and the government always start off fear-mongering. All these dangerous anarchists are coming. All these dangerous anarchists are coming. Oh, my God, the Black Bloc. And the media, instead of responding skeptically, which is what the job of journalists should be, just sort of parrots these lines. So, I mean, I don't know how you can say this story isn't newsworthy. I don't know of any other case where people are facing 75 years in prison for, for protesting. Um, and I don't know of any other case where such a theory of collective liability has been imposed on people. I mean, under the U.S. Constitution, I mean, if you have a First Amendment right, it's an individual right, you cannot be denied it based on the actions of others. So if I'm out protesting with a group of people and somebody else throws a rock, I don't suddenly lose my right to assemble. That person might, but I don't. And also to arrest someone and charge them requires individualized suspicion, not just I was in the wrong place at the wrong time. So this case is entirely um, out of line with the traditional constitutional jurisprudence. It's out of line with international human rights law. The UN Special Rapporteur on Free Assembly has been very clear that a violent protester does not make a protest violent. And on top of that, the charges they're facing, like even if we were to assume the prosecutor's case was slam dunk and true, which it isn't, I mean, 75 years in prison for breaking windows, I mean, that is an absurdly disproportionate draconian punishment. So all of those elements together, I'm just sort of flabbergasted that nobody in the media thinks this is newsworthy. 
Right. And not just breaking windows, but being in the presence of someone yes. who broke yes. windows. Yes. Right. Yes. yes. Um, and, you know, you know, on the point about the media, unfortunately, it's not just the media, too, who have been ignoring this case or uh, downplaying it. But it's also the re people in the quote unquote resistance. When we look at uh, how this protest has been treated, it's not by many prominent figures in the resistance, people who say that they're against Trump. This one has been kind of um, cast aside. Then people have even been punching left, saying that, you know, that because there was property damage there, it doesn't represent us. But, you know, not standing up for all those who went out to, on that day, put their bodies on the line, as people in Antifa have been doing, to protest Trump. So listen, Chip, uh, let me end by asking you, what is next? Can you give us a preview of the first of the mass trials that are starting next month? So the next the next mass trial will, or the first mass trial will start in late November. Um, the defense filed a motion to dismiss the charges, saying they were unconstitutional, both because the indictments failed to allege any actual crimes besides wearing black and chanting and walking, um, and all, but also because the, that they were defective. That was denied by the judge, which is very frightening because that means the judge very likely will accept the prosecutor's legal theory which is just utterly gobstoppingly shocking to me. And the defense also put forward a mo motion to compel the release of the prosecutor's legal instruction to the grand jury, because the defense argued that, you know, no grand jury would return an indictment based on the facts alleged by the prosecution. And the judge also rejected that. On top of that, the defense or the DOJ is now getting these warrants to look at organizers' electronic communications. They sought to betray uh, the DisruptJ20.org website as an organizer of a riot. I was at a hearing on, on Friday of last week about getting information from people's Facebook accounts, and the DOJ prosecutor said they, that a uh, like on Facebook of a specific post could be probative of criminal intent. The example he gave was if you liked a post about how to dress in black block for, quote-unquote, the riot, they always have people when they're describing what they want to find, talking about the riot, because so the activists were emailing each other, oh, wear this to the riot, bring a crowbar to the riot. It's, it's, it's ridiculous. Um, so This point you're mentioning here about seeking online data, it's so critical. Initially, the government wanted the IP addresses, addresses of anybody who visited yes. the J20 website before the protest. And then they amended their warrant, and they claimed they never wanted that. They had no idea the government had that, or they had no idea DreamHost had that information. And the DreamHost attorney pointed out in court that in the warrant, in the text of it, they specifically um, requested that information. So the government comes out with these very broad warrants and then plays very coy. And they claim they're only looking for specific evidence. In the DreamHost case, they cited a listserv discussion about who was bringing crowbars to the riot. But, I mean, the felony felony rioting charges are based on political expression as being evidence of a crime, then, I mean, they're, this is a witch hunt, and the more information they have, the worse the situation is. We'll leave it there. Chip Gibbons, journalist, and also the Policy and Legislative Council for Defending Rights and Dissent. The piece, just up at the nation, is called The Prosecution of Inauguration Day Protesters is a Threat to Dissent. Chip, thank you. It's always a pleasure to do The Real News. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chip. And thank you for joining us on The Real News.